for it. I'm going to pick two case studies, the Cuban Missile Crisis we've heard something about already, and the Sino-Soviet War of 69, and then look at what lessons that might teach us and where it might lead us in the future. So I'd say there are two basic themes in nuclear crises. Cock-ups, where you blunder into a crisis, and a conspiracy, where you do something deliberately. Cock-ups outnumber conspiracies. Key thing, although they follow very similar trajectories, is they don't come out of nowhere, and they're resolved by diplomacy. So I'll come to the Cuban Missile Crisis. You've heard some of this from John already. You had two mutually suspicious, even hostile power blocks building up through the Cold War. And when it came to Cuba, you had the revolution of 1959 and nationalisation of particularly the fruit company. The lack of information that John alluded to is partly down to the intelligence gathering process. It was slow. Photography had to be processed and analysed. Human intelligence, unreliable. So, as he said, you don't know much about what the other side is doing. And all this feeds into your perception of what the threat is. Now, in 62, the US Marine Corps did an amphibious invasion exercise in the Bahamas called Ortsac. Now, if your name's Castro, you might find that a bit worrying. And as the crisis developed, there were a lot of escalating responses. You mentioned the quarantine, the confrontation in the UN Security Council between Adlai Stevenson and Valerian Zorin, don't wait for the translation, all fed into the hysteria of the moment. And then you have what I call trigger incidents. These happen way down the command chain, on the ground. And there, was, there were several, all of which happened on the October the 27th at the height of the crisis. Rudolf Anderson's U-2 was shot down over Cuba, decision taken by the local air defence commander. And a Soviet attack submarine heading towards the Caribbean was being signal depth charged by US vessels. And the three senior officers were debating whether to use their nuclear torpedo. Two said yes. A commander, Vasily Arkhipov, said no, it had to be unanimous, they didn't fire, but it could have changed the course of the crisis, well, almost, it would have changed the course of the crisis, let's be honest. It did get resolved. The key, one of the key factors in resolving the crisis was what became known as the confidential channel. This started out as private meetings between Bobby Kennedy and Anatoly Dobrynin, the Soviet ambassador in Washington, and they hammered out the basis of the agreement. The Russians promised to withdraw their missiles. The Americans promised not to invade Cuba, and they did so publicly. And th this lack of communication is what prompted the hotline. Again, John mentioned these. And it was the sea corn where lots of all the arms control treaties came from. There was no progress up until the Cuban Missile Crisis, quite a lot afterwards. You ended up with detente, and it all fell apart in the 70s. But the Cuban Missile Crisis wasn't the end. There have been several similar confusion-based crises. None of them have anything like the profile. Turning to the Soviet war, this was a deliberate act. After Stalin died, Moscow and Beijing started going on separate paths. Mao was particularly scathing. Uh, he had internal problems, some of which are still haunting China today. And one of the differences between the deliberate action, you don't just need to be hostile, you need something else. In this case, and in the case of the Cargill War, it was disputed border. The border was drawn on the Chinese side of the river where custom put it in the middle of the deepest channel. So the Chinese decided to take back the territory. They limited their goals, so they only picked on the number of islands in the Asuri River, largest being Zhenbao. The concept being, if you pose too great a threat, then the other side is likely to escalate. So keep it small. You're not going to generate a, a, a big conflagration. But there is still a risk of escalation. You had war fever. You had outbreaks in other frontier zones. And there's always what used to say in the 19th century, marching to the sound of the guns. You, the, you, the formation next door is fighting. You join in. And then it spread, can spread very quickly. I mean, so it did get resolved again. Fortunately, in some ways, Ho Chi Minh died on the 6th of September. As Jim Hacker says, funerals are much better than summits because nobody has any expectations. But people got together, arranged for Alexei Kosygin to stop in Beijing on his way home. They didn't let him out of the airport terminal, but he did meet Zhu Lai and they talked and they agreed to negotiate over the borders. They agreed to maintain the status quo and then discuss the border, which had almost already been set and uh, before things broke down. And it took another 
35 years and the collapse of the Soviet Union before the border was finally settled in the Chinese favor. But it provided openings. China was largely ignored until then, but it gave the Americans a chance to build relationships with China as a balance to the Soviet Union. And Nixon went there. China took, the People's Republic took the seat on the Security Council from the Republic of China. And we saw something similar in the Kargil War between India and Pakistan in 1999. <coughs> so what, does, what do these crises teach us? If you start shooting your mouth off, naming military operations after the leaders of countries that you don't particularly like, it makes people nervous. And this was a particular factor in the Able Archer crisis of 1983. One way of heading off crises and sorting them out is to be able to talk at the top level very quickly. We've seen that the hotline agreement came out of the Cuban Missile Crisis. You can do it in other ways. And when you do start making agreements, make them transparent so you can see that the other side is cooperating. It builds trust, and trust is the, 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 what leads to stability. If you really can't talk to each other, have a third party involved. Now, the UN in 1962 was basically for a slanging match. It's getting better, but it has, obviously has, there are blocks involved. And if you can come up with some sort of rule structure that people will sort of promise to abide by, it will make people a little less twitchy when things start getting difficult. And above all, in 1962, people remembered Hiroshima and the Great Patriotic War. We need to remember what happens if we fail to maintain stability and control crises. So a quick bit of crystal ball gazing. All the usual suspects here, it didn't take, actually take a lot of thought, and you'll hear more about some of these from later speakers. I would say uh, with relations with Russia look like they're about to go into one of their periodic troughs, given the comments of General Makarov last week, but we'll have to wait and see what happens. But the world is getting much more complicated. More nuclear powers, more economic powers, climate change. All of these things make things much more complicated, and crises can spring from anywhere and follow unpredictable routes. So we need to be ready, and we need structures in place to get stability, or at least to bring it back from the brink when things do start getting out of control. Thank you.